Thank you everyone for uh, attending today. I know we have a lot of online people that are gonna be checking in right now. My name is Jim Dewinsky. I'm Metra CEO and Executive Director. On behalf of Metra in Boma, Chicago, I'd like to welcome you to the first and hopefully the last Safe Return to Work Summit. Before we begin, I also want to thank our generous sponsors, Wintrust Bank, William Blair, BMO Harris, and I'd also like to thank our exclusive media partner, Cranes Business Chicago. On the rail industry, we always start every day off with safety briefings. Safety is our core, it's our top priority for our passengers, our employees, and the public that we serve. Every time we have guests in a room, and since we're in one of our facilities today and we have guests, we're gonna to start today off with a safety briefing. I'd like to introduce Jackie Watkins to give us our safety briefing. She's from our safety department. Again, good morning, everyone, and welcome. We are located at 147 West 47th Street. This is our Rock Island maintenance facility. Again, I'm Jackie Watkins, safety. And your safety today is our top priority. Please keep in mind as we move throughout the facility, Metro personnel will be on task to make sure your safety, again, is top priority. This is a live yard, so please, no one should venture out near any of the tracks. In the event of an emergency, Metro personnel will be on hand to dial 911, and they will instruct and guide the emergency teams as well as the emergency vehicles throughout the yard. The shops are all equipped with AEDs and safety kits. We have already pre-identified CPR personnel. Today there will be no scheduled fire or evacuation drills. And lastly, if we encounter a situation that arises, we will instruct you as to where you will go within the facility. Thank you again and have a safe day. Thank you, Jackie. And I want to again welcome anyone who's joining us online. It has been almost a year, matter of fact, possibly a year to the day I hear that COVID-19 has rolled into our city and our region. That fog still hovers over us, taking lives, separating us from the ones that we work with and love, and disrupting the business that fuels this economy and this great city. Now with a better understanding of the virus, vaccinations being widely distributed, safety protocols are much higher in place in society, it's time to get Chicago moving again by bringing employees back together, back to the workplace. Although technology has ushered us through this pandemic and we've worked with it functionally, there's no collaboration tool that can replace or perform as well as in-person teamwork, one-on-one, -on -one, or even larger teams. And as my colleagues at Metro know, I say all the time, you can't build a company culture on a video call. But no matter how or when you plan on bringing your employees back to the workplace, today's summit is designed to give you the confidence and the tools and information that you need to make an informed decision, a decision that will make you and your employees confident. We have a great speaker lineup today. I'd like to introduce them. Leading off our panel today is Dave Casper. Dave is the CEO of BMO Harris Financial Group and BMO Harris North America. This morning, Dave will share his insights on the economic impact of returning the office and the importance of in-person collaboration. Then we'll hear from Metro's own Chief of Staff, Janice Thomas, who will speak on behalf of Transit and what Metro is doing to help the riders on board and at our stations. Following Janice, Tony Sacco, who is the Chief Operating Officer for Riverside Investment Development. Tony will be discussing building technologies and best practices in the office space. Heather Spearman will then speak and address the communication between tenants and the employees, as well as cleaning and safety protocols that have been implemented across Chicago buildings. Heather is the Executive Vice President and Regional Operations Manager for Jones Lang LaSalle. And finally, 
Last but not least, definitely not least, we'll hear from Dr. Robert Murphy, Professor of Infectious Diseases at Northwestern's University Feinberg School of Medicine and the Executive Director of the Institute for Global Health. Dr. Murphy will provide an update on the virus, the current state of vaccinations, and a medical view on the safely returning to work. So with that, I'd like to welcome Dave. Hey, uh, thank you, Jim, and thanks for joining. Uh, I'll pick up right where Jim left off uh, you know, a year ago. So close your eyes and think about what happened. Uh, <laughs> I can remember the first case we had, and uh, you know, we had people practically in hazmat suits coming in. Nobody knew really what was going to go on and, and how we would deal with this. And so much we've learned over the last year. What I've learned more than anything, though, is you can never quite be prepared for this. We do, as a bank, we do stress tests on everything. <laughs> we stress test everything, including pandemics. But the reality is we couldn't really stress test this pandemic. And until you're actually in it every day, seeing what's going on and how you respond, um, you just don't know. And I'll tell you, um, I'll start with our people that are not working from home, but working from work. Uh, it's hard to be a teller at a bank, and we have uh, 600 branches in the United States and 1,200 branches overall. It's hard, it's hard to be a teller and work from home, and you can't. So we've had, just as many of you have, we've had very good, our first responders out in front every day. So they've set the example as to how you can do this, how you can do it safely. Um, but we've had a lot of people working from home uh, and in areas where you wouldn't think. We have traders in Chicago and in New York City trading uh, you know, hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars by the second. It's hard to do that from home. When your dog is barking, your uh, husband's yelling at you to, uh, how do I fix this and do that? And we have some women traders that uh, have remarkably done well, but they want to be back. Notwithstanding the fact that it's pretty tough to have the internet to run a trading business uh, from your home, it's pretty tough to collaborate when, you, when the person next to you is trying to trade. And that's just one of our businesses. Um, you think you are ready, and we are ready, and we're now ready to be back. Um, let me talk about three things. Um, let's start with what uh, we hear all the time. We've all said it, and uh, I'm frankly getting tired of it, the new normal. Um, and uh, what that means for a lot of people is, hey, you know what? And tell me if you haven't heard this. We're actually more productive at home. And by the way, for, for those that commute, as great as uh, Metra is, it's uh, sometimes you can't always work. So you could actually be more productive by using your commute time. You absolutely could be to work, and many do. But what they're forgetting and what uh, is not uh, at all apparent to everyone, what they're forgetting is exactly what Jim mentioned, and that's you know, what you miss when you're not back at home. So uh, when people talk about the new normal, I say, uh, no, this is not the new normal. This is the abnormal, but we're getting, we are getting back to normal, and normal is getting back to the office. Uh, and there's three reasons. I think number one, <laughs> now, trust me, not everybody's clapping. Uh, but most people are, and, uh, and uh, we'll get into that in a second. But there's a couple of reasons. First, it's really psychological. Um, as Jim said, people do need to, to react with people. And uh, while many of us have the ability to work from home and be with our spouse or our family, our kids, uh, many don't. Many are in 10 by 10 uh, luxury apartments, <laughs> some sharing with someone else, but many alone and they don't have that ability to interact. And they're, quite frankly, they're afraid to go outside. I get that, I understand it. We have employees of all ages that are that way. I totally sympathize with them. They want to be back, but they just aren't, they're afraid that it's not safe. Um, we're leveraging some great technology, but you cannot replace just human interaction. Uh, the second reason I think this is not the new normal is from, for us, for our bank, it's cultural. It's cultural. Um, collaboration and recognition, face-to-face -face recognition and face-to-face -face collaboration when we're talking about our clients, 
what we're going to do, how we're going to deal with them, how we're going to help them. Um, you can do some of that by phone. You can do some of that by Zoom or Teams. But the real opportunity to get around the room and talk with your peers is critical. And what's more, I mean, it's, uh, um, you don't have to look very hard at me to know I'm not at the front end of my career. But I was at one point. And what I saw is probably the most important thing that is missing today with so many of our younger and mid-level people is the fact that they can't actually be mentored the way you can. And we, we do team calls all the time, as I'm sure many of you do. But it's not the same. It's doing OK for the time being. But people miss the mentoring. And they don't even know they're missing it. So many of our younger people, and we hire hundreds of people right out of school every year. They haven't been in the office. Or if, if they have, they haven't been in regularly. So they haven't had that interaction. And that cannot stand. That cannot stand, not for our bank, not for a bank that is built on relationships first with our people and then with our clients. It's a very simple business. But it's not simple if people don't know how to work together. Um, one thing I will say is so people don't think that commerce just stopped. Uh, we did, and a number of our sponsors, everyone stepped up during the pandemic. And the banking system really stepped up together with the PPP loans. And that was great. And they did it. They did it over the phone, on Teams, staying up countless hours. Tell me, I guarantee you, they were not more productive being at home. They would have been in the office. They would have had better internet. They could have gotten things done. But they did it. And the, grad, the uh, gratification they got, you know, think of a banker, 26 years old or 25, talking to the CEO of a $300 million company or a $3 million company or a three-employee company. And think of the gratification they received when somebody called them up, and it could have been any one of those three CEOs and said, thank you, you have saved jobs. BMO saved 20,000 jobs, put $5 billion out, most of it in Chicago, but not all of it, across the country. And so did many of the banks. But that was just dealing with the issue. We can't survive on PPP loans. And many, many uh, companies and small businesses were not able to get it or they were not able to keep it. Um, and the third reason that it's so important is financial. And I'm not talking about the financial uh, situation of our bank. We're going to be fine. I'm talking about when you get off the metro train and you walk to your office, or if you're out in the suburbs, take a look around at all the restaurants, all the small businesses, all of the companies, big and small, that rely on people actually showing up for work. That needs to come back. As a bank, we have been in this business for 203 years promoting commerce. Commerce is not just being able to say, we can work from home. Commerce is actually supporting those around you. And that's why it's so important. That's why it's so important to get us back. So I'm not saying get back and the hell with safety. Far from it. It starts with safety. It always has at our office and at our bank. And I think that's probably the most important thing. And that's what is the most important people for our people when we're coming back. Uh, we're not going to compromise on that. We never have. We never will. But what we're saying and what we're telling people is, and I can't, it's hard for me to contain my enthusiasm for the vaccine. The Johnson & Johnson is just another plus. If the president is right, and I think he is, uh, most people will, that need to be vaccinated will be vaccinated or they'll have the supply by the end of May. And I'm actually at the front end of that. I'm taking the under. Uh, every day I hear of more people getting it. Of all ages, we're starting the right way. We're taking care of the people that need it most. But there's going to be enough vaccine for people to be back. And what we're telling our people is watch this. And when the vaccine is readily available, when you'll be able to take it, that's when we're starting back. And we'll start back. We'll probably bring back 50% uh, right away, though. We'll say, hey. Three days, two days, and by the way, it's not Monday and Friday, uh, we're off. Uh, and most of our people want it. But we're also going to listen. We're going to listen because there's some good reasons why people are concerned. You have to have empathy right now. And, you, and everyone has a story. You have to listen. But you also have to lead. And I think that's what we need to do. We need to lead, lead from the front. That's what we're doing in our bank. We've said safety first, leader led, come back when it's safe. But, and you, you've all learned this, and I'll close with this. 
everybody has a slightly different definition of safe. And without being judgmental, I've, I can be judgmental. I've checked my jun judgmental genes at the, at the door because uh, there's a lot of reasons why people aren't safe. But listening, understanding, hearing the facts, that's what's critical. And I'm also going to say, uh, so I see my buddy up there, um, I'm really excited about uh, where we're going. We're going we're gonna to be in a, tall, in a very tall tower that as I drove by today, it keeps going up uh, 50 floors. BMO is going to be on the top of that floor in terms of our sign. We're going to move in next year. It's going to be state of the art, state of the art HVAC. I don't think I'll have to ever touch an elevator. I can use my phone to get there. And people are excited about that. And that's also, whatever you're doing as an employer, you need to lead with safety. And I know we are doing that. So I'm excited. I want to thank you for uh, the opportunity. Let's get back to work as soon as we can safely. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Chief of Staff of Metra, Janice R. Thomas. Good morning, and thank you. And thank you again to Dave. I would like to begin by taking all of you into the way back machine, all the way back to mid-2020. It was at that time when researchers and the media, without much evidence, were quick to call out transit as a major cause of the virus's spread. Of course, if you think about how little we knew about COVID-19, it's very intuitive. You have a small area with a lot of people in it, most of whom you do not know. Dangerous, right? Well, this time, they got it wrong. But let's start this by using an analogy. In the opening months of the pandemic, there was a great deal of concern surrounding airline travel. We can acknowledge that some of this may have been a very been a way to control the virus from spreading by limiting the movement of people. But were these fears warranted? Well, in October, Harvard University released a landmark study that said, and I quote, with proper precautions, flying can be safer than grocery shopping. Let me repeat that. Safer than grocery shopping. Apparently, because of the air exchange, HEPA filters on board and mass protocols, the report indicated that the odds of the virus droplets expelled by an infected passenger reaching the breathing zone of another passenger is only three in 1,000. Three in 1,000. Now, I don't want to give a lesson on probability, but please think about that for one minute. If I take a bag, and I fill it with 997 clean red balls and three blue balls that have COVID-19 on them, then I close my eyes and I reach into the bag and I grab a ball. Am I really going to pick one of the three COVID balls or am I going to pick one of the other 997 clean ones? So I'll get on board and agree that airline travel is safe. But let's come back to public transit. From June 1st to September 12th, this past year, more than 202 million rides were taken on subways and buses in New York City. And as you can see from the graphic shown here, ridership increased, average case counts dropped by 55% over that time span no correlation. This observation was consistent across the country. No correlation. But what about our city? During the entire pandemic, with over 5.4 million rides on board, 
We have not had one case of COVID-19 contact traced back to our trains. Not one. But you're probably wondering, why is that? And what makes transit so safe? Is it the short duration of the trips? Is it people wearing masks and not speaking? Is it the train cars are not completely full? Is it deep cleaning procedures? Is it ventilation and filtration? What would make Metra so safe? Well, let's take a closer look at how we've created safe rides. The ventilation on a metro train is truly robust. The CDC recommends a minimum air change of 12 times per hour to combat infectious airborne diseases. Well, our cars replace the air 15 times per hour uh, every four minutes. In addition, our trains make a stop on average every 5.2 minutes opening the doors and flooding the cars with more fresh air. Now, while fresh air enters the cars and circulates inside, it passes through MERV 13 filters. These filters are considered hospital grade and may catch potential virus particles that travel on respiratory droplets. The graphic shown here gives you a sense of how the system works. But we cannot take safe rides with only the train's ventilation system. We know that masks are one of the most effective measures to control the spread of the virus. This past April, Governor Pritzker created Executive Order Number 32, requiring masks and face coverings indoor public places. Metra immediately complied by making masks mandatory for all employees and all riders. We also know that keeping people as distant as possible will help stop the spread. So Metro implemented a one person per seat policy and have limited seating to 35 passengers per side, or roughly 50%. When we approach that number, we will add on train cars as needed to keep everyone spaced out and safe. And to help communicate this, we created an online ridership dashboard so riders can see how full cars are before getting on. But when it comes to cleaning, Metro has spared nothing. We are meticulously cleaning sanitizing and disinfecting our trains daily. And we're following the strictest CDC guidelines in doing so. Remember, when you could not find hand sanitizer in store shelves, well, Metro was out in front of that. And we install hand sanitizers on every car in a matter of weeks. And speaking of touching things with your hand, we have been encouraging riders to use the Venture app so conductors do not have to trade cash or punch tickets with our passengers. Over 60% of our riders are currently using the app, and this number is growing. In summary, we have blocked the virus in every possible way we can conceive, but we must continue to tell our story to build confidence. I would augur that in my experience, just about every problem can be resolved by good communication. Let me show you how we've been communicating with our riders and your employees by using every communication tool available 
and by leveraging our own and earn and pay media channels. But before we do that, you've probably been wondering why you keep seeing my metro and what it means. My metro is an important initiative within our transit agency. It is our most sacred philosophy and fuels our mission. Ask one of our employees and they'll tell you that my metro is about taking personal responsibility for our riders and for each other. And I can think of no greater way to build confidence among riders and letting them know that we have their backs. We want to think of Metro as my Metro. And we want everyone to think of Metro as my Metro, because it really is. Under the umbrella messaging of my Metro, we launched a safety campaign called Commute with Confidence. And true to our motto, we use Metro employees in our communication to tell our story of personal responsibility. So let me share that with you now. On board our trains, we have distributed almost 50,000 pieces of safety content across 1,000 coaches. We have also taken messages to all of our 242 stations. We have communicated our plans with the media and will continue to build on that relationship to make sure everyone is aware of our most sincere desire to make safety a priority. We have been taking our messages to the expressways, which, by the way, are starting to get more crowded. Here you can see real Metro employees telling our story. We have taken our messages to the airways, television, and on the radio. Here, you see Beth, one of our conductors. We have put our messages on social media. We have made our website a hub for safety messages. We have even reached out to community leaders to help us spread the word about transit safety. And the feedback we've been getting is good, really good. And our riders are telling us they feel safe on our trains. And we encourage you and your employees to visit our website anytime you'd like to hear their stories. Here's a quick snippet of what you'll find there. Yeah, I definitely feel it's safe. There's been a lot less people, at least in the trains that I've been on. So luckily, like they've had one person per seat. I feel pretty good and safe going on these rides every day. I do. I feel, I feel very safe on the Metro. Everyone is wearing their masks. Um, it's not a lot of riders on my train. I've been feeling safe. Um, I know they're cleaning the trains. There's Right now there's not a lot of people, so there's plenty of social distance, so I feel plenty safe. I think Metro's doing a great job, especially with traffic coming into Chicago. That itself is something that I at least don't enjoy. I drove a lot this summer and just hated it. Um, much happier being on the train. Now, let's take a look at the result of hundreds of riders we surveyed. We asked riders to tell us, on a scale of one to 10, how comfortable they feel about riding Metro since the pandemic began. I should point out that the respondents were all regular riders before the pandemic. Some of them were still riding while others were not because their offices were closed. But with the 10 being most comfortable and the one being least comfortable, take a look at how much confidence has grown since May 2020. You can see that a full 50% of respondents were pretty comfortable, with half of them being extremely comfortable. But as we get closer to reopening our offices and bringing back employees to the workplace, we acknowledge the challenges employers and HR staffs will face. 
It is the tension between the habits we created over many decades and the concern for personal safety. These attributes are at odds. Add to that, some employees have found personal freedom in working from home. They too will resist returning. But the return makes good business sense for Chicago, and so does the train. The train is economical. The train reduces our carbon footprint. The train allows you to work, read, or play. The train gets you there on time. And as I have outlined, the train is safe. So Metro will stay the course and we will be diligent in our safety procedures. We will continue to look for new ways to make riders be and feel safe. And finally, we will continue to communicate and tell our stories of safety to everyone. I want to thank you for your time and your interest, and I would like to leave you with one final thought. I moved to Chicago in 1991 from Alabama, and over those 30 years, I've become one of you. I've learned about the strength and the toughness of Midwestern stock. And I know with proper planning and more vaccinations happening every day, we are strong enough to reopen our offices, strong enough to bring our people back safely, and strong enough to save our powerful local economy. With that plan and a little of God's help, I look forward to a better and brighter 2021, and I wish all of you a safe return to work. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Tony Sacco, the Chief Operating Officer for Riverside Investment and Development. Hi, everyone. Uh, I really appreciate Jim and Dave and Janice's comments, and uh, I'm honored to join my colleagues here today to discuss uh, this critical topic affecting uh, the economic future of our downtown and our city at large. Um, the, the, one of the main points I'd like to try to make is um, Chicago is ready to get back to work because we're already at work. Uh, what a lot of people talk about is who isn't in the office. I'd like to talk a little bit about who is. Um, almost every building in our city, which is about 150 million square feet, has been open continuously through the pandemic. Uh, this has been in support of companies and businesses that were designated essential at the outset of the pandemic, which includes a lot of folks that you might not necessarily expect. It includes financial service companies who are the economic hub of our city and our communities. It includes technology companies that are making our remote work possible today. Uh, it includes healthcare management companies that run our hospitals and our healthcare facilities and employ the amazing doctors and nurses that have been caring for people during the pandemic. And it includes real estate companies that have been managing those buildings and trying to derive solutions that enable our tenants and their employees to run their businesses in a safe and effective manner. Um, that's been possible uh, as a result of an extreme compliance with a rigorous set of federal, uh, regional, and local guidelines that have been established and continuously updated. Um, and, and really, I think Dave mentioned communication and relationships. Uh, keeping businesses and buildings open has only been possible due to an ongoing dialogue and shared responsibility uh, between real estate owners, their occupants, and then the managers of those buildings. And that's resulted in proactive adaptation of systems, operations, and tenant facilities, or all three in most cases, uh, which involves hundreds of millions of dollars invested into our physical infrastructure and our real estate. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit today about building systems and best practices uh, that are examples uh, that have, of, of what's been deployed across our city and our country at large. Um, our firm uh, and our peers have been in continuous discussion with our tenants, really to try to understand their needs and try to facilitate whatever is necessary to enable them to run their businesses more effectively during this pandemic. Um, 
with them, we've engaged designers, specialist consultants, our facilities managers, uh, to talk about our buildings. And the topics that I'm going to cover today represent the most frequently discussed uh, issues that come up over and over again. They include ventilation, filtration, means by which to induce uh, secondary or supplemental air purification, how to effectively monitor air quality to have assurance and, and the feeling of safety in addition to the safety itself, vertical transportation, and then ways to interact with the built environment less. Specific to ventilation, I, I really want to make two points. One, uh, Chicago leads the way from a code standpoint. We have uh, among the highest standards for minimum fresh air requirements of any municipality anywhere in the world, much less the United States. Uh, the result is we have up to two to two and a half times more minimum fresh air delivered to our buildings than other municipalities around the country. The second topic is our climate is particularly well suited to bringing in significant amounts of outdoor air into our buildings. So in addition to having uh, very high baseline requirements, our buildings operate at a much higher level uh, in terms of proportion of fresh air to overall air within the buildings. This is why Chicago leads the world in terms of the proportion of its buildings that are sustainably certified and why Chicago is going to lead the world in our country in the number of buildings that have health and safety designations such as well and others. <laughs> Janice touched on filtration and, and she's absolutely right. Um, you know, with very little effort, most of the buildings in our city have made uh, immediate filter change upgrades to MERV 13 filters, which capture 50% more of small uh, vapor-borne uh, pathogen particulate than traditional MERV 10 filters. The cost of this is a minor increase in energy consumption, which I think everybody would agree is a worthwhile trade given the current circumstances and probably makes sense uh, long into the future. In addition, uh, and, and Dave was kind enough to mention the building that we're working with him on uh, here in Chicago, newer buildings are able to deploy even more rigorous filtration standards, such as MERV 15 filters with a pre-filter in front of it, which results in an even higher and incremental benefit in terms of capturing small particles uh, and, and further mitigating potential spread of, of airborne pathogens. Secondary air purification is a belt and suspenders approach to trying to make sure the air within occupied space is clean. Uh, the two most effective and broadly used methods uh, that we are familiar with include bipolar ionization and the use of ultraviolet lighting or ultraviolet germological irradiation. Say that 10 times fast. Um, both of which have been proven in laboratory studies to be 90, in excess of 99% effective in eradicating uh, uh, viral pathogens such as COVID-19 uh, when exposed uh, to the virus. Uh, in addition, um, our tenants are using uh, other strategies such as portable filtration, such as HEPA filters in highly populated rooms uh, such as conference space, lunch rooms, et cetera. One of the things that our firm is most excited about is some of the advancements in indoor air quality science, uh, particularly the means by which we can monitor, uh, convey the results of, and then integrate the data from that monitoring back into the operating uh, structure of our, of our buildings. Um, basically, much in the same way that a Nest thermostat modulates the, your furnace in your, in your home automatically via the, the data that it receives, uh, there are sensors that at a very low cost measure indoor air quality across a host of attributes uh, and can be integrated back into the automation systems of a building to thus ventilate not only based on temperature but based on air quality. This is a standard that we think is going to become broadly adopted on a go-forward basis around the country. The topic of vertical transportation comes up all the time and frankly, pre-COVID, people don't like riding on crowded elevators uh, and, and it's, it's not necessarily the, the, the most fun thing to do, setting aside a global pandemic. Two points I'd like to make. Uh, one, the average elevator trip across every building of every age is less than two minutes. 
and I, I think you know the doctor will be kind enough to kind of share some facts, but uh, short exposure times have been demonstrated to not have uh, significant increased risks for um, um, acquiring the COVID virus. The second thing I'd like to mention is all elevators are actually ventilated by code. So you're changing the air continuously, not only when the doors open, but when the elevator is moving. Uh, to the, the result of which is that you're getting an air change per minute or 60 air changes per hour. Uh, Janice mentioned the, the, the guidelines uh, suggesting that 12 air changes per hour uh, is the recommendation. Uh, and then finally, uh, new emerging technologies, uh, such as the ones that we're deploying in our buildings, uh, such as destination dispatch, elevator controls, drastically reduce the trip time uh, for, for elevators even further than uh, they already are, uh, and enable social distancing as a standard feature, meaning you're not getting on an elevator uh, with, more than four with more than three other people, so four people total at any given time. And then finally, virtually every building in the city has some form of, of mitigation uh, to reduce the, the amount of interaction that uh, employees and, and occupants have with the built environment. Uh, the two primary means that have been broadly deployed includes a variety of antimicrobial coatings and alloys, uh, as well as the deployment of uh, touchless fixtures, uh, including uh, door actuators uh, and plumbing fixtures within the bathrooms. So I appreciate the opportunity to speak today, and hopefully, uh, you know, this is convincing as to why our buildings are, are ready to come back uh, and ready to take employees. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome remotely Heather Spearman, Regional Operations Manager for JLL. Thank you. Good morning. We're happy at the bridging and uplifting. I wish I could be there. Day, but unfortunately was not able to. Um, let's get right into building operation. Our agile property management teams have been on site as essential workers over the last year, evaluating and customizing their strategies in great detail. We can get started with our current situation. What does downtown Chicago look like today? Like Tony said, our buildings have been open all along. Building owners and managers have customized their reentry plans and adjusted procedures to enhance the tenant experience and allow for business continuity all year. For us, that includes 40 office buildings currently under management downtown. Right now, office buildings are roughly occupied between 10 and 20%. While we know this is a low number, we also know this will continue to evolve and change with coming events and as people continue to uh, return back into the office. What we need to know is how much and what. So there's three things I'll cover. One, what we've done. Two, what tenants are doing and maybe some what they should be doing. And three, how communication can maximize our, our collective success. So here's what we've done. Healthy buildings. Wellness is top of mind for occupiers and owners. Our teams have worked diligently to ensure best practice protocols are identified and clearly communicated. So what changes have been made in buildings during the past year? You'll see enhanced cleaning protocols. The means, methods, and frequency have shifted a great deal, going from cleaning areas to disinfecting areas, including robust training programs and certifications for employees and companies. You'll see special attention paid to high touch and high traffic areas. Those are the visible changes. Uh, building access and entry protocols have changed. A lot of buildings have moved to touchless entry, one-way entry and, and traffic flows, uh, found various solutions for health screening, social distancing, facial covering requirements, signage and physical barriers. Systems optimization, Tony touched on this in a lot more detail. Our engineering teams are maintaining the highest levels of filtration possible and fresh air intake. Uh, like Tony mentioned, exceeding ASHRAE standards for years. We're enhancing the use of our building controls to maximize functionality and leverage inherent capabilities within them. From there, we're identifying necessary upgrades and managing through implementation as needed. Our supply chain and procurement for essential supplies. It's absolutely critical to be able to maintain reliable sources for ongoing procurement needs through the foreseeable future. Things like hand sanitizer, gloves, materials for protective barriers, PPE for our cleaning, security, and engineering staff are absolutely essential to keep on hand and maintain going forward. There'll be some changes in your common areas and amenities in terms of protocols. You'll find new restrictions, shared, sorry, new, new restrictions in shared spaces like fitness centers, conference centers, food service. Your tenant engagement programs have likely gone virtual. 
we just need to be paying attention and making sure that we're following those things. Those might be solved by technologies, they might be solved by reservation systems, or simply just by making sure that we're limiting access or limiting numbers of people in certain spaces. So let's take a look at what our tenants are doing. As a firm, we've interviewed thousands of companies and what we've learned is there's a broad range of readiness out there as it relates to reentry planning. Some things our tenants are doing, they're conducting really thorough in employee surveys. A big, uh, a big factor in this equation is what the employees expect and what they're looking for and what they want in terms of maintaining top talent. They're also taking evaluations, really close evaluations of every job description and individuals within those job descriptions to see where they fall and identify what the need is. A lot of companies are considering staggered re-entry, evaluating their near-term, long-term, and indefinite needs regarding who needs to return full-time versus any considerations they're taking in for hybrid solutions or staggered shift, as previously mentioned. Uh, behavioral and procedural enforcement is a big thing. You know, the building is, can only be responsible for so many people and what they're able to do. So we really look to the tenant to identify how they can educate and, and adjust and help correct some of those individual behaviors. We're all responsible for ourselves. Um, the next one is office reconfiguration. If, the, if, if companies are considering de-densification, identifying who those experts are that they can leverage to determine if this is needed and to what degree and how much they're willing to spend. Uh, lastly, we're looking at technologies and certifications. Companies are evaluating what's out there, what makes sense for them, and what's going to make the workplace more attractive than, say, a work-from-home option. This could be anywhere from your AV uh, technologies to just your day-to-day -day needs in terms of cleaning and sanitization. So lastly, we'll discuss a little, a little bit about transparency and why communication is so key. Real estate is a community and buildings are run by an ecosystem designed to, ser to serve your needs and pivot in this ever-changing landscape continuously. Here are some ways we've communicated our plans and resources to our tenants. We've, uh, we've distributed uh, tenant checklists, things to consider before planning into our employee returns. We've hosted tenant panels, open forum discussions with multiple tenants in a single building to consider before planning, before employee returns, before creating those plans and communicating them back. We've shared tenant memos and notifications, both for the proactive and reactive scenarios we've seen in the past year and how we can help provide that content to, to companies that might otherwise not have it readily available. So what do we need for from tenants for to make sure that we have a, a seamless re-entry? We need insights into the tenant's re-entry status uh, strategy. Who's coming back? When? How many? We've heard things like 50%, 75%. We've heard things like um, summertime, Labor Day. Really gathering that information in a single building is critical to helping us make sure that we're ready to adjust what we've planned in buildings with fewer occupancy and as we go forward. We can make some assumptions here, but it's really helpful to know what, what is being planned. I know there's a lot of kind of hurry up and wait or a lot of what are other people doing going on right now, but that's really critical. So if your landlord has sent out a reentry survey, please fill them out. If they haven't, talk to your landlord. Maybe there's something there, you know, they need to know from you, or maybe it's something that was missed, or maybe there are other resources they can and should be sharing. Gain a true, clear understanding of the differences between the building responsibilities and the tenant responsibilities. There's been some confusion regarding these expectations. Where do our responsibilities end and begin? It's really important to know if you're planning your reentry strategy so that you know what your building is prepared to do, and more importantly, what they're not prepared to do or what they're not willing to do. So um, communications of those expectations and compliance with new procedures to your employees prior to re-entry is really critical to helping for work toward a seamless community of, en of entry and bringing our folks back to work. Adaptability, lastly, and flexibility to changing circumstances and allowances is pivotal, is absolutely critical. We're doing it. We've asked it of our teams. We're definitely asking it of our tenants. So. Thank you again for your time and attention. I know I had a lot to say in a very short amount of time. Please feel free to reach out with questions. I know there's time at the end to allow for that. We can do this, Chicago, together. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome from Northwestern Medicine, Dr. Robert Murphy. Well, thank you very much for inviting me here this morning uh, to speak with you. I'm going to talk a, just a few minutes on like what's up with the virus. 
what's up with the vaccine situation and when we can safely uh, open up uh, our workspaces and, uh, and uh, places where we like to congregate. Starting with the virus, one year ago today, uh, the WHO declared that coronavirus-19 was a pandemic. It was about two or three weeks after most of the experts had already figured that out. But back then, think of what was going on. We did not even recommend people wear masks. At my hospital, they gave, they, it just didn't make any difference. Of course, in the hospital, you wear a mask, uh, you know, but it was not recommended for people. It took us a while to actually figure that simple thing out. It turns out uh, we had thought, well, the virus is so little, it's going to just go through all these masks, which is true, except the virus doesn't go by itself. It goes in a respiratory droplet. And it took us a little while to figure that out. It's indisputable that the masks are quite effective. Uh, and then when we decided to use the masks, guess what? We didn't have any masks. They're all made in China, most of them. And the Chinese were having a worse epidemic than we had here. As you see the numbers, there was only a couple thousand in the United States and Illinois at the time. We couldn't even get masks. My hospital and many other hospitals gave me one of these 25 cent masks once a week. I put it in a brown bag after I used it. That was the situation back then. Nobody would have thought that we would have the many millions of cases worldwide and 29 million here in the United States with our 529,000 deaths in a one year period. That was just not even contemplated. We as a nation did a very bad job at the beginning getting testing off the ground. Remember trying to get a test a year ago? You couldn't get a test a year ago. It was, it was almost impossible. Uh, masking, we gave a mixed message at the beginning and you know, there's still people today that had mask burnings in parts of the United States recently. They were so happy to get rid of the mask, which is a bad idea, by the way. Uh, we ended up as a nation, the number one country for coronavirus in the number of cases and the number of deaths. I mean, it's embarrassing for a high income country, a developed country like this to be in this position. So that's the bad stuff, and we've, we're recovering from that. But the good thing is, we invested in vaccine research. If you asked any expert a year ago, not one of them would have said we would have had a vaccine in 2020. We were, we were, we were betting between ourselves. You know, we're nerdy infectious disease epidemiologists. The closest was like maybe spring 2021. That was really as close as we got. And, you know, thank God we were wrong. Uh, and the government through BARDA, uh, one of the government agencies, actually pre-invested and pre-purchased hundreds of millions of doses and got these little companies and big companies off the ground to deliver our first vaccine at the end of November of, of 2020. That is phenomenal. We have never, ever developed a vaccine that quickly in, in history. It is really nothing short of phenomenal. We can thank the Chinese a little bit because they discovered the virus on, uh, on New Year's Eve uh, in uh, 2019. They sequenced the virus uh, by the second week of January in 2020, made it public, and the companies immediately started working on the vaccine. So th this is incredible that this has gone this fast. Not only are the vaccines I incredible how fast it went, but the new technologies. I'm sure you've heard of mRNA vaccine. This is a brand new kind of uh, development for a vaccine. The FDA's, you know, they said, well, they set the bar pretty low. If you're 50 or 60 percent effective, uh, you know, we'll prove you. That was, our, that was what we were starting with last March and April. Well, as you know, they hit a home run out of the park. 95% efficacy for these vaccines. This is, this is phenomenal. I don't know if you realize how phenomenal this really is. Two mRNA vaccines uh, and now an adenovirus vector vaccine, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, also recently approved. So we have three in the United States. There are s at least seven other appro others approved around the world with an older technology. They don't work quite as well, but they work. And they're being distributed uh, basically uh, as we speak. So it, it has been really, the, the vaccine part has been a gigantic success. 
On the virus part, because the, there's still so much virus replicating, viruses don't have brains, all right? They just replicate. And they make mistakes in their replication process, which causes them to mutate. Now, I'm sure you've heard of some of these variants of concern. The British variant, B117, is taking over in the United States. It's already 50% in California and will completely take over in the US by the end of April. That's six weeks away from now. Why is that important? It's much more transmissible and it is more lethal. There's another variant in South Africa. We have fewer of those cases, although the first case identified in Illinois was from Rock Island, of all places. How did the South African variant get in Rock Island? Who knows? I mean, that's just how crazy this thing is in spreading. And then the Brazilian variant, P1, another deadly virus. Brazil is in a lot of trouble right now, ladies and gentlemen. It, uh, they have the worst virus, and they also have a, an incredibly chaotic system trying to deal with it. So these variants are coming, and it's basically like two trains going on parallel tracks. Are we going to vaccinate people fast enough to get the viral levels down, or are the variants going to completely take over? Uh, and that is the race we're in today. The good news, more good news, about the vaccines, you may have heard this week, uh, the current administration, all the vaccines, by the way, are purchased by the government and are given out free. The, your tax dollars have already paid for them. So uh, Johnson & Johnson, which uh, the third uh, company that uh, 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 released a vaccine with a vaccine developed at Harvard Medical School, uh, only requires one dose. Uh, and they had, the government had pre-purchased for $1.95 billion, 100 million doses. So we already have 100 million, and that's what's coming to us right now. The current administration has purchased another 100 million doses. Uh, just this week, they did that. Uh, and so that will come uh, after the delivery of the first 100 million is going to be by April, and the second 100 million will be shortly after that. You can't just turn a dial and get vaccine production any faster than it's gone. Uh, it's tragic that we don't have enough vaccine. It is physically, technically impossible to go any faster than we are going. We are already going faster than anybody ever imagined. But this situation with the vaccine shortage is ending very soon. Within two months, we're going to be looking for patients to vaccinate. It's gonna go from not enough vaccine to not enough patients. The people signing up now, they all want the vaccine. Now, after that, we've got to go into the groups that are hesitant. There's a huge amount of vaccine hesitancy in the United States right now. In groups as disparate as, you know, inner city, non-English speaking communities to, uh, to healthcare workers working in nursing homes. What gives here? I mean, it's just, there's some things just really don't make any sense. And we've got to make our messaging clear. For instance, today, it was announced in the Chicago Public Schools that the kids are going to social distance to three feet. Oh my God, you would have think they'd dropped a neutron bomb somewhere. It turns out, if you go back and look at all the data about respiratory viral transmission, which there's actually plenty of, and there's all these reports prepared about, which of course nobody bothered to read until recently. The actual distance you have to be to have a significant decline in transmission is three feet. That is a minimum, and it's highly statistically significant. Going to six feet, it's a little bit more, but only a little bit more. Well, I mean, and it makes sense. If you go 50 feet, it's gonna be even less. We're not gonna be 50 feet apart. But if you at least get down to three feet, and if you at least vaccinate people, you're going to see a major, major change in the transmission of this virus everywhere in the country if we can beat the variants. And I think we can beat the variants uh, because of this vaccine increase in supply uh, that's going to happen. Um, how are we going to move basically our society back into some kind of 2019 uh, position. It's going to go by steps, and it requires herd immunity, which may be 70 to 90% of everybody being vaccinated. 
and before we get to that point, because those people that don't want to take the vaccine are going to be harder to uh, encourage to take the vaccine, is we're going to have a thing called vaccinated only VO is going to happen. It's already happening. So if any of you have traveled to a tropical country, you have to carry one of these cards. It's an international vaccine certificate. It's for yellow fever because yellow fever is so deadly. Uh, what you're going to have now is this, a, something like this. This is a CDC approved card for myself. This is my card. For myself, I had two doses of the vaccine. It tells the date I got it and what vaccine I had. And basically, I'm vaccinated. Uh, and you're going to have something like this. There's another group uh, that has a, a, a not-for-profit group that has made uh, an entity called Common Pass. And there's another one that has done something called the Green Card. Uh, and actually, most of these are digital. And people are going to have that on their, on their phones. And already, Qantas Airways, in case you happen to want to go to Australia, because that's the only place they go from here, you have to have proof that you've had the vaccine before you go to Australia now. Uh, Australia, by the way, has fewer than seven cases per day. They have 28 million people. They have almost none. There's no masking. There's no social distancing there. They don't have to do it anymore. Uh, we're not going to get there with the social behavior change. It's just not going to happen in America. But we're going to get there with the vaccines. Uh, and that is coming sooner than later. So you're going to have this vaccine-only group. And this is going to extend, as you know, CDC on Monday listed the guidelines. You can now, grandparents, go visit your grandchildren. You might not be able to visit your children because they probably aren't vaccinated yet, but you can visit your grandchildren. So your, our little bubbles that they've been talking about are expanding as we speak. And it's going to be groups of people who are vaccinated. So it's going to start with the families and, and close friends and neighbors. It's going to be maybe an office setting, your office that you have or your facility here, you know, you may require for on-site people that everybody's got to be vaccinated. You know, we have these requirements for measles vaccine. The hospital, if I don't get vaccinated for influenza, which, by the way, has almost disappeared because it's been taken over by coronavirus, but on November 1st of every year, if I don't have the influenza vaccine, I can't go to, the, I can't go to work anymore. That's been going on for quite a while. Daycare centers, too, also have that. So there is a history uh, and, and uh, there's experience in requiring vaccination. And vaccination works. It's working much better than we thought. In the um, Johnson & Johnson trial, you know, some of these numbers are a little bit confusing to people. Oh, it's 62 percent effective. But then if you look at the United States, it's 72 percent effective. And then it's this effective. This. Not one person went in the hospital. Not one person died. That's, that is what is required, and that is what's happening now. So this thing is all getting toned down. We're going to be able to open up. It's got to be in steps. You may have to wear your mask even though you're vaccinated, but when, if, when you start increasing your bubbles, you won't have to. And it's going to happen sooner than later because by the end of May, as the government has told us, the government owns all the virus. That's why I keep referring to them. Because you can't just go buy it. There will be enough vaccine to vaccinate everybody. And not only will we have to find the people that don't want to get vaccinated, the hesitant ones now, but we will, be, we will be donating vaccines to our neighbors. Because keep in mind, if we don't vaccinate everybody in the world, this thing will never go away. It will never be controlled. It's got to be a worldwide phenomenon unless we just close the borders forever. And we don't want to do that because our business is critical, international business, travel, we're, you know, we're a global community, and, uh, and, and this, is, this is gonna happen. And that is how it's gonna happen. And I'm very optimistic, but, and I'm, I'm really excited uh, that uh, Metro has done what they've done. Uh, as you, maybe some of you know, I was a little critical of Metro at the beginning uh, with the mask thing, and then I found out it's actually, the law in Illinois it has nothing to do with you. And you've done a beautiful job cleaning up the train system uh, and making a safe travel. And it's the numbers tell the story. There's nobody on these trains that has gotten infected. Isn't that enough? That is enough. 
ladies and gentlemen. And so I thank you again uh, for inviting me. Thank you, Doctor, and I, I want to thank the entire panel. If we have some time for some questions today, um, I think we can do that right now. I want to thank everybody for attendance today, and, and while they're seeing if there's some questions, we do have a train car downstairs for anybody in person. If you want to go down there, we've got the cleaners down there. We can show you exactly what we do inside the car, how we do it, chemicals we use, and we'll let you even squirt the fogger if you want. It is right downstairs after this event. Yeah, does anyone have any questions in the room? She's gonna, she's, she's, she's gonna grab the mic. Yeah. If you uh, tell me first, and I'll repeat it into the microphone. So this question is for Dr. Murphy. Uh, he was referring to what Tony said about four-person occupancy in the elevator. He was wondering your opinion on that, if it's safe to have four people per elevator. Uh, you know, I'm having trouble uh, hearing you. Can you sure. maybe move over and take your mask off and ask the question oh, again? Yes. I, this sounds a little muffled. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. So this question is for you. Uh, he was asking, he was referring to what Tony said about the four-person uh, occupancy on the elevator. Oh. And what was your opinion on that? Yeah. Yeah, so the, uh, it was brought up a little bit earlier. The high risk is 15 minutes you're within three feet of a person over a 24-hour period. So how long are you on the elevator for? You know, not too long. If you're wearing a mask, that, you know, goes completely away. And if you're vaccinated, it goes away even more. So vaccinate. Maybe you, we're going to have to use masks for a while until we get to the same level as Australia, a country like Australia, but New Zealand also, uh, and uh, then we'll be okay. So it's, it's, it's not bad. I mean, we have people limits on the elevators, uh, depending on the size of the elevator. It's usually four or five people. So, you know, that's all you really have to do, and you'll be safe. This question is for Tony. He was saying, you know, what about the older buildings? Uh, he's actually a tenant in one of your uh, buildings that you manage. So how do you mitigate risk in one of the older buildings that don't have the technological uh, features that you were referring to in your presentation? Yeah, so I, I, what I tried to talk about today was uh, broad-based strategies that can be deployed more globally. Uh, there are specific technologies that are obviously particularly well better suited to a, a newer generation building. But in terms of increasing ventilation, improving filtration, those are two things straight out of the box that virtually every building of every age can do. Uh, and in combination with masks and then not letting people who are sick actually come to work, uh, you know, is going to capture a significant amount of the risk. In our, in our view. So this question is also for Tony. Uh, so she was wondering if, you know, what about this open con open floor plan concept that so many businesses have, you know, implemented to their workspaces now? Is that going away, or do you see them adding more space to accommodate for the more open floor plan? 
So um, trying to predict what's going to happen is difficult. I can maybe speak to what we're directly seeing from our tenants. Um, you know, Dave and BMO are one of them. Uh, William Blair, uh, one of the sponsors today, is a, is a financial services firm in one of our buildings. Bank of America is one of our largest tenants. Um, none of those tenants have made broad-based changes to their workplace strategy. And the reason for that, at least as it's been explained to me, is that they were already pre-designed to be flexible and responsive to uh, different types of workplace strategies. So how many people are in on a given day? Uh, where do they need to work? Is there a shared space where they can work remotely from their desk? Um, the types of communal areas and activities that are provided within the tenant space, it all enables them to be very responsive and flexible. And as a result, they've communicated to us that they don't need to make uh, meaningful changes to their, to their workplace, which includes things like uh, uh, hot desking or hoteling um, and free address uh, uh, desking where you don't have a designated seat. So um, I'm, I'm sure that that's going to be different for every type of company, but um, I, th I think our expectation is things are going to uh, gradually get back to equilibrium rather than take on some new you know, character that's broadly different from what it was pre-COVID. Uh, Tony, can I just add one thing? It's, it, it is definitely going to change to some extent, to the extent that people were, you know, if they thought they were on top of each other before that, that won't, that's not going to fly, and nor do we need it to. As Tony said, we won't have as many people in on every day, so we'll have plenty of room to spread out plexiglass where we need it. But we're also planning to a point where, as the doctor said, where it's going to be uh, much, much, much less risky. But we won't have people as crowded, and we won't need to. We'll have plenty of space. Uh, to continue on with that type of question, uh, Tony, uh, he was wondering if, you know, <laughs> sorry, uh, he was wondering if, you know, barrier walls or sneeze guards would be an effective way to, you know, mit mitigate those risks of, you know, transmitting any type of viral, you know, transmission or higher cubicle wall, excuse me. Those types of things are actively being done. We have, you know, sneeze guards and, and barriers in our office as an example, and we're seeing that broadly applied in, in other tenant spaces. And as Dave mentioned, trying to spread people out a little bit and, and give a little bit more room um, is probably a good idea for the long term. So this question is for Metra. Uh, he's wondering how you are going to adapt uh, your staff and your operations to, you know, accommodate more for more ridership. Um, you know, back when <laughs> 2019, how are you? How are you going to manage that? Yeah, so that's always something of a concern. As Janice pointed out, we have a ridership dashboard which takes our current train schedules and it shows in very colorful green, yellow, orange, red. We never want to get to red. That means we're getting too full. We're either going to add cars or we're going to add trains behind that. And so we've been monitoring that every week. Back in the beginning of this pandemic when there was some hope and signs that maybe there's something could miraculously happen overnight and people would come back, we would actually stage shadow trains, trains that are staged in the yard that could come in in the event, kind of like what buses do. If a bus gets too full, it just keeps running. Same thing would happen with trains. We used to be able to do that with Cubs games. That hasn't happened in a while. But the other thing we're going to do is start enhancing the schedule. We're going to start putting a lot of the trains back on the schedule. The federal relief money is finally coming into the point where we can start planning a little broader. We know the lights have to be on before the people come.
<laughs> this one's multiple choice, right? <laughs> Last question, uh, Dr. Murphy. Uh, he was wondering how, uh, you know, because of the vaccine eligibility and how it's really only, uh, you know, 65 and older right now and right. essential workers, how will you encourage, you know, workers and how to get back to the workplace and, and what, what types of, you know, why would they want to get back exactly? Why do they not want to get vaccinated? Is it? No, 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 because it's so restricted right now. Like, yeah. what types of ways will they, yeah. you know, encourage yeah. employees no, to get the, back? The whole problem now is supply and demand. You know, we have the demand and we don't have the supply. But if you just look at Illinois, just two weeks ago, they were vaccinating 25,000 people per day. Yesterday, they did 104,000 vaccines in the state of Illinois. So it's increasing like that. And every week, these, uh, the um, capacity is increasing you know, significantly. And this is going to, going to continue to the point where we're going to have more vaccine than people to vaccinate. So, then, so what they will do, as soon as they get these high, they've decided to uh, uh, vaccinate the highest risk people for dying first. So the biggest risk for dying is age related. Uh, and then they vaccinated essential workers. And now they've thrown in uh, many places, people at high risk, like diabetes or some kind of chronic, any, many kinds of chronic disease, and as the supply increases. Now, some states in some counties, even in Illinois, have already vaccinated all those people. So they've loosened it up even more. There's several places in the United States now, anybody over 16 can get a vaccine. So it's really just supply and demand. All right, well, thank you. I'm I want to thank everybody again for attending and for those viewing. Um, it'll be on the website for those who didn't get to see it live. Um, talk to your colleagues, talk to your coworkers, talk to the other business and tenants. Um, we're excited. I think all the, the panel today really put forth a, a great effort and a great story talking about where we're heading. Thank you very much, Dr. Murphy, for the latest and greatest numbers and update. There's a lot of encouraging signs for all of us. I want to thank um, Metro's communication staff for all they put together and our great partner in LKHNS. Let's all have a safe return to work.